pilot and a Hello and welcome to Shaka Extra Time. I am Paul Indiho. Joining me on set is Shaka Sali himself, a.k.a. the Kavali Kid. Hello, Shaka. Hello, Paul. How are you? I am hugely terrific. Uh, you look, you look dumb dapper. Well, I'm looking up to you, my friend. Exquisite man. Thank you, sir. A warm welcome to you all. Our Facebook followers are watching us live. Our Shaka Extra Time is a show that comes to you every Tuesday. And today we'll be talking about uh, uh, the cyclone that has devastated the thousand uh, part uh, of Africa. Uh, and we'll be talking about maybe how uh, the impact is had in Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe, and uh, uh, Malawi. Uh, Shaka, your thoughts? You know, it's, uh, the cyclone has really been very, very devastating. Uh, uh, when you look at uh, the southern countries that have been affected, and especially when you talk about uh, Zimbabwe, you realize that uh, Zimbabwe is actually the focus of um, international sanctions, especially sanctions from the United States of America and all kind of stuff. I think, frankly, this is the time that uh, uh, Zimbabwe should be able to gain some sympathy uh, so that um, its people at least can access some food, can access some medicine, some water, and some shelter, really. Mm. Uh, what, what can government do or the international community do at this point? Well, first of all, uh, I think governments do have uh, some type of warning systems. They should be able at least to um, learn, uh, you know, have information that uh, uh, gives them the ability to be able to at least predict uh, what could be coming so that uh, they could be in a position uh, whereby they can actually uh, get, get in a situation where they can begin to protect their population. Especially they could probably want people to come from uh, areas which could be very easily affected, especially when you're talking about floods. This is not the first time it has happened. But, but Shaka, we are talking about natural disasters. Yeah, earlier you mentioned something about uh, sending out a warning. I mean, even in developed countries here, we've had uh, periods where, like, for example, in uh, Florida or in California, they have wildfires. In Florida, they have uh, hurricanes. Every time they come, it's a totally, it, they totally devastate the place. I, ag uh, I agree. But you see, governments have responsibility to provide security to their people. Uh, if they do have some information, suggesting that uh, such and such a thing could probably occur, then they can, in fact, begin uh, making decisions on the basis of the knowledge, the information they have, uh, so that they can remove the population from areas that could otherwise be in harm's way. Uh, there are certain things that can be done, and there are other things that uh, may not be very easily done. And some of the things that they may not be able to do as a government, they could probably get some form of help, some form of aid from international community and all that kind of stuff, they should be able to do something. Provide food, for example, provide water, provide medicine and what have you, uh, and in some cases provide shelter. I mean, uh, again, you're talking about uh, countries uh, that uh, are heavily dependent on uh, subsistence uh, farming. Uh, you're not talking about mechanized uh, farming here. A lot of people, so therefore, a lot of people have to live in these lowlands uh, so, so that they can provide for their families, maybe uh, be able even to sell a little bit of food uh, uh, to survive. Yeah, you know, when, whether, whether, whether you like it or not, uh, parents, for example, in countries that are not... Uh, uh, developed uh, to the extent that you are probably talking, they still have the responsibility of protecting their children, protecting their families and all that kind of stuff. And so governments, in fact, are uh, in a situation where they must provide uh, some kind of help. They must be able to justify their own existence. The government is there to protect, first and foremost, the security of its population. And there are certain things that they can do, Paul. I'm not saying that they will do everything, but surely they should even be seen to be doing something at least. Uh, could, this, 
could this be a result of uh, climate change? Because we've had uh, uh, floods uh, before, but this time around it looks like uh, this uh, was just too much. Uh, 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 as we speak, it's still a rescue mission. They're trying to uh, look for people. People can't even account. They don't know how many people have died uh, in this uh, uh, period. It could be climate change, as you say. It could be El Nino. It could be a lot of other factors. And it's very interesting that um, you're having situations where uh, you talk about Kenya, you talk about the Democratic Republic of Congo, you talk about Uganda and what have you. These are places which have not seen rain, you know, recently. And in fact, they are experiencing a bit of or some kind of drought, if I, if you, you know, when you think about it. And yet, when you go a little bit south, they are simply having more uh, rain than they in fact otherwise need resulting in two floods and therefore cannot even control what is going on. It's, it's very, very, very sad because sometimes when Mother Nature uh, actually decides to be very, very angry and unleash its uh, anger and all that kind of stuff, uh, uh, man finds himself in a situation where they can't do much really about it. Uh, you and I earlier were talking about how there is like a backup plan here in the United States that uh, they have FEMA. Uh, a body that uh, usually comes in whenever the a natural disaster strikes. Uh, what would you say would uh, take uh, some of these African countries uh, to form something similar to that, where, let's say, if a natural disaster strikes uh, a region, they can be able to come in and maybe give support uh, to the people who are uh, coping with uh, those uh, 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 dangerous situations? You know, what is very interesting that uh, you, now that you mentioned, uh, you mentioned FEMA and what have you, uh, when you look at um, a lot of uh, African countries, you look at their governments and what have you, you will probably find that each of those cabinet uh, portfolios uh, that they, each country has, there is in fact a docket of disaster preparedness. But it seems like uh, beyond simply talking the talk, they do not really walk that talk so that people can walk the walk. You have a ministry of disaster preparedness, and sometimes when you look at uh, their budget and what have you, you don't find much. You find a lot you know, to be desired. Most of the money is in the Ministry of Defense, is in the Ministry of National Security, is in intelligence, is in police, you know, those types of coercive, you know, type of institutions that make people essentially behave, remain in place so that they can actually be ruled rather than be governed. And I think that uh, governments should sincerely uh, get their priorities right. I, I am not saying that I'm the best person who knows uh, how to do it because I've never actually had uh, the dubious privilege or being in charge of a country, or being in charge of a government and what have you. But there are certain fundamentals, sincerely, that need to be looked at. And when it comes to the lives of people, these governments, if they have to justify why they have to be in power, they need to be able to do some of those things so that they can actually make a difference. Uh, earlier, you talked about the sanctions uh, in Zimbabwe. How much of an impact, uh, now that they are dealing with this kind of situation, they have uh, a natural disaster, uh, disaster striking, uh, killing a lot of people there, they can't access anything from the outside world. How can they deal with this kind of situation? I think that, um, you know, uh, to be very honest with you, uh, those people who are having Zimbabwe under sanctions, at least they should be able to develop some kind of empathy and sympathy, given that uh, this is a situation, as you rightly said a little bit earlier, uh, which is actually being caused by Mother Nature, not necessarily man himself. I think they should really be able to revise their policies uh, and figure out how to accommodate you know, some of these uh, very devastating type of situation. It is rather, it's in fact catastrophic. And it is not, of course, limited to Zimbabwe. You're talking about Malawi. Uh, you're talking about uh, Zambia. You're talking about some of those neighboring countries. Mm. Yeah. Let's go to a comment here. Uh, Johnny Cash. I think government should invest uh, uh, more on development. Is this a development issue here? 
Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, provide some infrastructure, for example. Yeah, infrastructure is a reflection of development. Uh, but in places, we've, I gave an example earlier of places where the infrastructure is solid and uh, they still have to deal with the uh, natural disasters. Yeah, but you can build some places and areas where, for example, where there is uh, uh, some kind of a disaster, there are some places where you can evacuate. When you rescue uh, people and all that kind of stuff, you should be able to at least have somewhere safer, somewhere where you can put them and you can be able to take care of them in the sense that you can have them have unfettered access to some fundamental needs. Talking about uh, food, for example. Mm. Talking about medicines, because you're going to have people getting injured and all that kind of stuff. So you need doctors to come in, nurses, and you name it. Yeah, sure. You need planning. Uh, okay, let's continue with the comments. Uh, let's go to another interesting comment. Uh, they say, Shaka, why don't you talk about Somaliland? One of the most successful stories in uh, on on the continent. Uh, nobody ever talks about Somaliland. Uh, in fact, uh, right across uh, from Somaliland, you have Somalia that has been engulfed in uh, war for a very long time. Now that they're also beginning to have a semblance of uh, stability, uh, talk about Somaliland. I have to admit that uh, you know uh, whoever is saying that makes me actually feel guilty. I think we. I think the, I think the person who raised that issue is correct. Somaliland, uh, at least when you read about it, uh, when you talk to people that have been there and what have you, and you look at it in the context of what is happening in Somalia, uh, it pretty much looks like uh, a success story. When you look at it, for example, politically, it has arguably uh, a very a type of democracy that is the envy of that particular region. You have predictable elections, which in fact are elections, not selections. Elections, in fact, uh, that at the end of the day produce results, who, results that reflect the will of the people who actually go to vote. And yet, you also don't have, for example, Al-Qaeda operating in Somaliland. Uh, you have peace and stability in that region. And yet, when you talk about Somalia, you're talking about Al-Qaeda, you're talking about uh, instability, you're talking about insecurity, you're talking about a lot of things that, frankly, do not, you know, to people who live in Somaliland, that is like foreign or alien type of culture. So I think that um, it is up to the African Union, sincerely, uh, to kind of like look at what is going on in that region and figure out how uh, to at least make some kind of arrangement where Somaliland probably could in fact be recognized to such an extent that it can actually be um, a sovereign nation just like it, like it were uh, when it was under the British protectorate, I mean it was a British protectorate for example until it became independent in 1960, joining the Somalia, Somalia, which was earlier under the Italians. And when the Italians lost the, the war, uh, it became, uh, it, it basically was under a United Nations trusteeship. Mm. But that trusteeship was being presided over by the British. So when the independence came for Somaliland, independence also simultaneously came for Somalia. And then those two countries decided um, essentially to enter into a sort of political marriage. Mm. But when you reach a point where uh, one party, at least one of the parties, decides that uh, uh, they see some kind of, uh, uh, I guess, equivalent to irreconcilable differences, I think you call it a divorce. Unfortunately, this is a marriage that actually is being forced. Uh, by outsiders. You're talking about uh, the African Union. Mm. Uh, Somaliland, by the way, the last time I checked, does not have any type of recognition. There is no country that African recognizes Union. it by the African Union and by the international community. And yet, and yet they're the most stable and very uh, peaceful uh, uh, part of the uh, a country that is very peaceful, very prosperous. 
in that particular region, yes. yes. Yeah. And you know, when you think about it, uh, they are really either what people call double or triple or code standards because the last time I checked, there was a country called Yugoslavia in Europe mm. under Marshal Tito. Under Marshal Tito, Yugoslavia was a very, very progress, very progressive, very prosperous, you know, entity. But once he actually died, Yugoslavia for some reason collapsed. Yeah, but the European Union took the lead of making sure that Yugoslavia translates into different types of sovereign nations. Yeah. Let, let's, let me do a quick follow-up here, talking about uh, the AU playing a role. Uh, we have a comment from Awasi uh, Emmanuel Wusu. Uh, good evening, Mr. Shaka. Uh, I'm calling from the Monrovia. What, what's AU saying about uh, the what are you saying about the Nigerian elections that were highly rigged by the present uh, government? You talked about AU intervening in Somaliland or doing something for Somaliland. Now you have a question here concerning AU uh, endorsing the election in Nigeria. It is very unfortunate because uh, the African Union, of course, uh, is seen as uh, a very, very influential institution and an institution, in fact, indeed, uh, that should be able to be in a position where it brings about uh, some kind of at least semblance of peace and stability on the African continent. But sometimes, uh, you know, there are critics who say that uh, the AU is in fact a toothless bulldog, or rather that it has a teeth, but these teeth cannot bite. Because at the end of the day, some of the critics say that uh, mm. it is simply a club of uh, African rulers, really. Uh, it doesn't really care so much, uh, or at least there's no reflection or there is no uh, evidence uh, suggesting that mm. uh, it is actually at the service, that it is providing service to the vast majority of the African people, but rather that it is a club uh, that uh, meets frequently, or at least provides uh, an opportunity for the African rulers or leaders or both um, to meet and wine and dine and what have you and stuff like that. I think it could do a much better job than that. Now, when it comes to Nigeria, Nigeria is uh, a very legitimate um, sovereign state. It is the largest you know, state, uh, at least in terms of population, on the African continent and what have you. Uh, it is a country that uh, uh, you know, plays a very, very big uh, role, for example, when it comes to international peacekeeping. Mm. When you talk about peacekeeping, you talk about Nigeria and what have you. So Nigeria is uh, expected to behave uh, and conduct elections, frankly, that are supposed to be elections, not selections. And from what I have seen, uh, at least in the past, uh, reports and all that kind of stuff, it seems to me that, uh, yes, there was an election. Uh, interesting. Uh, speaking of an election, uh, let's uh, cross over to your home country, Uganda. Uh, the ruling party uh, uh, a couple of days ago endorsed uh, the current president, uh, Yoweri Museveni, to run for another term. I think uh, they gave him a life presidency. Uh, your thoughts on uh, Uganda? You see, uh, it is very interesting that uh, you say the ruling party, but there are people, in fact, who say that in a country like Uganda, there is probably no party because... Uh, the party is the president, Yuri Museveni, that he has so much power that he pretty much gets what he wants. What is interesting is that uh, this time around, uh, from what I have seen, uh, it, it's like uh, they don't really, you know, they don't, they, they don't seem to know what to do because they seem to be actually doing things that many, many years ago, they decided that uh, they were not good things. For example, there was a constitution in place uh, when they came to power in 1986, and they looked at that constitution, and very interestingly, that constitution was a, was a reflection of a parliamentary system, and there was a presidency, which was, in a sense, a reflection of a hybrid of sorts. And they decided that, uh, no, this constitution was not good. They decided to go back to the Ugandan people, collective views and what have you, but the real thing really here was that uh, the NRIM 
just a good an opportunity to run the clock while consolidating itself, consolidating its power. It had nothing to do with changing one good constitution for a bad one. Because guess what? So many years later, that constitution is almost not a constitution. It, was, it has almost been transformed into a what some will characterize as a, a personal manifesto, not a constitution. Because the time limits, for example, that had actually been imposed in that constitution no longer exist since 2005. The age cap, which also was part of that constitution, no longer exists. To the extent that now they are actually going back to the same document that they looked at as a very, very bad, very um, something, frankly, that uh, was not worth uh, the values, the dignity, the character of Uganda. And now they are going back. So it seems to me that uh, the Yoweri Museveni who came in 1986, the man that was very, very contemptuous of African dictators, the man that was very, very progressive, the man that uh, said the right things, touched the right buttons and all kind of stuff, that man is no longer there. If that man came and met this one, the one that has been changing constitutions, turning them into personal manifestos and what have you, removing age caps, and yet not having the sort of courage that one former Ugandan dictator, Field Marshal, Idi Amin Dada, who claimed to be the conqueror of the British Empire, the man who declared himself life president, that the people had decided that he's so good that he should be life president. I don't see why Museveni can't do that. I don't see why he pretends that it is the people who are doing this, who are doing that. Because, for example, a journalist asked him, Mr. President, you said at one time, when you were so contemptuous of African dictators, you said that you did not respect those African leaders who stayed in the power longer, perhaps, than 10 years. What happened? What happened? I mean, what would he say, really? to anybody who asks himself such a question. But the first time when he asked that question, Paul, he actually said he still did not really want that to happen. But he had to succumb to what he characterized as the pressure from the people. He succumbed Speaking to of pressure. Speaking of pressure, there are a lot of people here who uh, want you to rise up to the challenge. Uh, let's go to a comment uh, from Olive Majek says, Dr. Shakasali, I don't believe President Museven wants to rule for life. Isn't it, is, is it not time for you to leave your microphone and come back to Uganda and be part of it? Well, first of all, frankly, I have to say that uh, I am profoundly flattered and profoundly humbled by the confidence expressed in me by that gentleman. And I also believe, by the way, that uh, when you think about Uganda, the last time I checked, it is neither a kingdom nor a monarchy where an individual is born into power or is born with a silver spoon, a political silver spoon in his mouth. It is a republic, and for that, if it still has a respectable constitution, it is simply a question of whether somebody actually meets the eligibility requirements. And if they do, then it should be assumed that uh, anybody who meets that should be able to aspire to anything, including the highest office in the land. How, how would you respond to critics who are saying that uh, by them, by the ruling party endorsing uh, the current uh, president to run for another term is a way of trying to stop a young entrance uh, like uh, uh, the famous uh, Bobby Wine, uh, opposition leader Kiza Resia, and all the other people who might be interested in uh, running for, for the top uh, office? I think that first of all you really have to look at uh, the history of elections in Uganda. 
how does Uganda really, how do the people of Uganda choose their leaders? Do they sincerely, do they sincerely have the opportunity? Do they have the tools? Do they have the space in which they actually make those decisions that are very important in any society that is democratic? Uganda is a country that is democratically challenged. And the kind of uh, uh, things we are talking about, I think, kind of like alien, really, to a country like Uganda. Because let's face it, President Yoweri Museveni, for the record, said at one time, when he seized power, that he actually killed his beast. He killed his beast. He seized the state. The state belongs to him. In fact, just like King Louis VIII of France at one time who said, l'état c'est moi. I am the state, and the state is me. He even went on at some point to actually even have the audacity to say that he could not see circumstances under which he could actually leave power on the basis of a piece of paper. In other words, we're talking about a vote. He is not the kind of person that uh, obviously anticipates or even dreams or even thinks about losing an election, so to speak. Because when you think about it, he has variously been characterized as somebody that uh, actually suffers from a disease of having a pathological fear of fair competition. He likes to compete against people whose hands, political hands, are tied behind their backs and their feet tied together so that if he can actually punch, and like I would say, Paul, can you punch back? How can you possibly punch back when, in fact, your hands are politically tied behind your back? Uh, and your feet tied together. Yeah. So we need to reach a point where Ugandans have the space, Ugandans have the freedom, Ugandans have the ability to actually make a choice, to make a choice that is based on objective conditions. And I don't think that uh, the current government in Uganda has that sort of confidence because it knows that almost Anybody, I mean, most people really right now when you talk to them, they will tell you that in fact what Uganda needs is change, not just today, but yesterday. Uh, what are you talking about uh, tomorrow on Straight Talk Africa? Tomorrow we are going to be uh, looking at uh, the upcoming elections in the Republic of Malawi, and uh, it is going to be largely based on. Uh, an interview that I had the opportunity to conduct in the Malawian capital of Lilongwe with the Vice President uh, Solos Chirema. Very interesting, and he will be wearing an incredibly gorgeous shirt. Uh, we have uh, about a minute. Uh, can you explain malpartism for uh, some Ugandans? They're asking you, what is the difference between malpart and presidential system? Well, first of all, uh, the two are not. Uh, really, <laughs> what you would say, they are not mutually exclusive. But partyism means that it is political pluralism. It means that you have more than one party so that you have the implication here, competition. A presidential system is whereby a country has the opportunity or has chosen a path through which the person who becomes the president of that country and occupies a state house go through a national sort of, you know, process. And that is different from what is called the parliamentary system, which is embraced by uh, Britain, for example, embraced by Israel, uh, by Germany, by a lot of other countries. Because when you are in a parliamentary system, what it, what it says is that it is parties that compete. And the parties, when they compete, in, again, a multi-party system, the party that wins or the coalition of parties cut you off. chooses a prime minister uh, or a president, as in the case of South Africa. On that note, I thank you so much for joining us today. We look forward to another edition of Shaka Extra Time. Until then, uh, so long from Washington. Thank you.